about my farm, I'm located in central Iowa, about halfway between Iowa City and Des Moines. Um, I lease four acres of land. I have about two acres in production, annual production. Um, I sell May through December, and my main business is CSA. I used to do in person farmers markets. I shifted to online, what I call online farm stand, just selling directly to my website. And then I do some online consumer co ops, and increasingly I'm doing more wholesale. Um, I've been growing for 10 years. Um, I also worked for three years on a certified organic farm in my heritage, which is very close to where I now farm. And I'm not currently certified, but I am planning on certifying this season, and I've always been organic and managed, familiar with organic standards, and I've always tried to follow those. Uh, just some pictures of the farm, and this kind of shows, I'm going to talk about the different parts of our farm, how we manage them. We, we have high tunnels that we manage in a certain way. We have uh, what I would call more intensive market garden style beds that we manage in a certain way, and then we have more uh, what I might call like broad acre plastic culture beds that we, um, that we use. So those are all parts of our rotation um, and cropping system. Just need to do the CSA share that we uh, had this, this past year. Um, so I feel like it's always good to start off a presentation with some disclaimers about what I can, what information I can and can't give you. Um, so this is just what we've worked on our farm so far, and this system will continue to evolve because I've seen how much has evolved in the 10 years I've been farming. And so obviously all systems are subject to revision over time, and you obviously just can't take a system on one farm and draft it on your farm and adapt to your circumstances and to your personality and to lots of different things. And what i found is that uh, even small variations in location and climate and soil type can make huge differences in whether a production system is going to work for you or not. So obviously something that, that works in northern Minnesota may not work in central Iowa, but even something that works in northeast Iowa may not work in central Iowa. So that's, don't take any sort of production system and think, well, this is it, because you have to then adapt it to your particular circumstances, which are always going to be different. And then, this is something that I, I feel like I kind of started to learn at this conference, and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, but don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So I think with crop rotation, especially early on, I thought I have to have a set crop rotation, I have to have this figured out right away. And the truth is that most, most farms do not have their crop rotation figured out, and that they're changing it over time. And that's not a problem, it's that you're, you're slowly moving towards your goals. Um, and so there's always going to be a gap between your plans and your actual like, you know, lived reality. And that's not a problem, that's just normal. Um, and I went to a presentation by Kay Jensen here that was probably probably 10 years ago, around the time I was starting to farm. And she mentioned this idea of the Fibonacci spiral. So like, progress is not linear. We tend to think of progress as just being a line where we just move from A to B. But actually, if our goal is the center of that spiral, we're kind of spiraling in towards that goal. And so she gave the example of, you know, day one when you start your farm, you're not going to necessarily have, like, written standard operating procedures for your workers. You know, that's not necessarily a realistic goal for, like, the first day you start farming, but maybe by, like, 10 years you might have that. So it's just a good way to think about, if, especially if you're starting out, that you're not going to, you're not going to have things perfectly set from the start. You're going to have to figure things out as you go. So I feel like it's always good to sort of interrogate uh, the assumptions that we're making. You know, obviously in organic standards you are supposed to rotate crops, so I understand that, but you know, the question is why do we rotate do we need to rotate crops? And it's everyone's favorite answer, which is yes and no. Because I think there's circumstances where we don't rotate crops, and then there's circumstances where we do. And I think in particular, almost no one rotates crops in high tunnels, even in organic systems. Most organic growers I know are growing tomatoes in the high tunnels every single year, which is not what you're supposed to do. But they're still doing it, and so why does it still work? Well, disease pressure builds up over time, so growers are usually using greenhouse-specific hybrid varieties that are very disease-resistant. People are moving into grafting in order to deal with disease pressure. Um, and I've also heard that you know, you can do that for like 10 to 15 years, and then after that point, it starts to get more difficult, where you can start to see like depletion in your soil that maybe is not apparent at first. So, um, so obviously the most immediate reason why we rotate crops is because of um, 
because of disease and soil borne pests carry over from year to year. That's at least, you know, on my farm, that's my, my immediate concern when I'm thinking about where do I put my broccoli this year, it's I don't want to carry over the black rot from last year's broccoli into, into this year's broccoli. Um, and I just want to throw out there that, you know, I've been exposed at this conference and others um, about, you know, ideas around you can actually prevent disease and pest pressure um, if you build up the biological activity in your soil and you have complete nutrition for your plants. And I've, I think we're all kind of trying to work towards that, but it's not necessarily a realistic, again, it's not a realistic goal from day one to have that in the situation. So we're all still dealing with these disease and pest problems. And so, yes, we need to, we need to continue to rotate. Um, so I think the big considerations for crop rotation are, are timing, so I think rotating different timed gas crops, so is it an early crop, is it a mid-season crop, is it a late crop, how far through the season does it go, um, what kind of window is there for a cover crop before or after that, and how will that influence what you can have there afterwards. So for example, if you have an early crop and then you plant an overwintering cover crop there, you probably don't want to have another early crop there the next year because you're going to have rye or something you're going to have to turn it in the spring. So the sequencing of how you sequence cash crops and color crops and being able to alternate timing is part of what you're thinking about with the crop rotation. Um, and then there's obviously the fertility of the soil and weed consideration. So um, there's the whole schematic of heavy feeder, light feeder, legume. So you have certain types of crops that use a lot of nitrogen, certain types of crops that use a little bit of nitrogen, and then crops that produce their own nitrogen. And now that's not a realistic rotation for most of us, because most of us are, are you know, way over representation of the heavy feeders, um, particularly we always talk about brassicas, always being overrepresented in a lot of vegetable farm crop rotations. So we're obviously not going to grow like equal amounts of each of those, um, but it's something to think about. Um, I think of another consideration is that there's crops that are easy to weed and crops that are hard. So like carrots and onions are crops that are very susceptible to early weed pressure. So you probably don't want to put those in your weediest field. You know, you want to think about what was the weed seed load like there last year? Did I let a lot of weed seed fall on the ground? That last year I thought maybe I don't want to put my carrots there this year. Versus potatoes, that's an easier crop to control weeds in. A little bit more tolerant of weeds. So those are things to think about. Um, So this is a this is a map of my farm um, that we uh, I think this particular map we actually drew up this past year, and this shows our field system and kind of how we how our farm is set up and how we rotate through these different fields. So uh, just to show you the what's called the short field north, short field south. Those are what I call the market garden intensive production type beds. So those are 100 feet long. They're uh, the beds are four feet to four and a half foot on center. Um, we tend to we manage those by hand generally, like in terms of work. We do no-till in these beds, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We tend to use a BCS walk behind tractor for preparing the soil, although I am increasingly setting them up for tractor um, spacing. Um, and they're bare soils. So we manage them as bare soil. And then we also grow uh, crops that are higher value and higher turnover in those beds. The long field, west, long field, east, and then the far field, those are set up uh, for tractor cultivation, and they're set up for laying plastic mulch, and so they're longer. Those are 265, 270 foot beds. So I kind of have a, a hybrid system on our farm where we have both what I would call like intensive market garden style production, and we also have what I would call more like a broad acre um, uh, plastic culture, tractor road utility type system. So as I mentioned, in the short beds, we do shorter maturity, higher value crops, so lettuces, um, spinach, carrots, beets, um, things that we can double crop. So our goal with that is to get two crops a year, at least, it's not free. Um, so there tends to be a higher labor input per crop, because we're going in there and we're cultivating by hand, and we're, doing, we're laying compost, potentially. So we're doing a higher labor input, we're wanting to get a higher, um, higher revenue. Um, in those in that, those fields, we tend to use compost as the basis for our fertility, so we're laying a significant amount of compost, um, and that's part of what we've been doing with our no-till trial that Hannah and I did over the last two years, where we actually tested out um, 
uh, no-till management versus rototill management. Um, and I did that in these heads, and so as part of that, we were laying down really thick layers of compost, and we were using that as the basically a mulch that we were then planting into without rototilling. Um, we use a, we use overhead irrigation in this in this section, and that's partly because we're doing a lot of hand cultivation. And if you have drip irrigation and do hand cultivation, it's really really annoying to have to work around drip irrigation or have to move it out of the way and move it back. So we moved to doing overhead irrigation in this in this area. That also really helped with germinating seeds. So like carrots in particular, we've had really two really dry summers, and both those summers I've germinated my carrots entirely on irrigation. Whereas in the past I germinated those with rainfall. And so that's been a really big part of being able to control more of our seed germination, especially in that summer, summer window. Um, and as I mentioned, we do weed control by hands. We use a lot of wheel hose. We set up our spacing so that we can use different types of wheel hose. Um, you know, so we, we tend to do things on two or three rows mostly, so that our, our spacing is sort of standardized, and it's easy for us to go into the wheel hose and just wheel hose the entire field. So with the long beds, uh, longer maturity, lower value crops. I'm going to show a crop list in the next slide, but potatoes, uh, brassicas, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, onions, garlic. Uh, we look at that as we're trying to get a single cash crop and a single cover crop per season. So we're trying to basically rotate cash crop, cover crop, cash crop, cover crop. Um, and so the cover crops are the basis of our fertility in those fields. We're looking to use those rather than the compost or the way to recycle nutrients and the soil. Um, and so we do use plastic mulch in those fields. I don't, I'm not set up for cultivation. I don't have a cultivated tractor. Um, I, I have one tractor that I use um, where the only cultivation I can do is blind cultivation, so it's not very good for actually weeding crops. I can weed the tire tracks in the, uh, between the plastic bed, but that's a big reason why we use plastic mulch. It's not something I necessarily see in a practice that we use forever, but I have to get to the point where I have the whole thing and experience to be able to get rid of it. Um, in those beds, we use drip irrigation because we just put them under the plastic bed. Or we lay them at the same time as the plastic mulch. Um, and then, like I said, we'll use the tractor to cultivate the tire tracks between the plastic. We'll also use the mulches between the, between the tire tracks, so landscape fabric, straw mulch, or we'll use wheel hose if we have time. So, picture on the left is our that's germinated carrots, like in, sometime in August. And so, that's our 100 foot beds, you know, the more intensive Mark Garden style production. And then on the right, that's um, we're harvesting overwintered onions, Bridger onions in June. And so there's also, you can see there's garlic and onions on either side of, of my workers there. Um, and so those are the plastic beds, and that's kind of a look at how those two different types of fields look. So these are, this is the kind of the, this has traditionally been our, our crop list, I say traditionally is in the last few years. This has been what we've rotated through those different beds. So, as I said, we, we, we cluster crops, and we grow certain types of crops in the short beds, and then we grow certain types of crops in the long beds. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the short beds, the emphasis is on shorter season, generally things that are 60 days, no more than 60 days with the you know, green beans, and some of these things are a little bit longer than that. But the idea is that we could grow two of these crops in a season. Um, and then the long beds, the goal is just to only get a single crop per year remove the plastic and put cover crop down or have cover crop and then fill that in and lay plastic. So one of the big changes we're making this year is we're really tearing down what we're growing. Um, we're trying to increase the amount of diversity of crops that we're growing and really focus on the crops that we feel like we grow well, have a, a good demand for them and we can actually grow profitably. So we've been dropping crops from our crop list. So the bolded ones are the ones we're still growing. And then the ones that are not bolded are the ones we've decided to drop. And by drop, I mean we're just not growing them at all, or we may be buying them from another producer um, who has a better system than us. So for example, we're getting sweet potatoes from someone who grows like six acres of sweet potatoes. They've got a tractor system set up for planting and cultivating. They just have a much better system than us. And so it doesn't really make sense for us to try to grow sweet potatoes, given our scale, given our equipment. So that's, this is an evolving part of our farm. Um, 
but this is just kind of showing you what we're still growing and what we what we dropped. Um, it does make crop rotation a little bit more challenging um, in some ways because we're growing larger amounts of fewer crops, and so we've got bigger blocks of crops to rotate through the field versus having more diversity that where we can rotate smaller groups of crops in the field. Um, but what we're looking at is this is kind of how I look at crop rotation. We have we have families of crops that we rotate through, and this largely has to do with disease. You know, there's diseases that affect certain families, like for example, black rot is a disease that affects the Brassica family. It doesn't affect cucurbits. Doesn't affect alliums. Um, so that's largely what's that based around. It's also based a little bit around uh, fertility, for example. So like you know, there's similar fertility needs within the Brassica family, and similar fertility needs within the carrot family. Um, so that is another part of why those are clustered together. But when I'm looking at actually making a map of the field and like where things are going to go, this is how I'm clustering things. And then within, within each of those clusters, I can like say, okay, the broccoli is going to go exactly here, the potatoes are going to go exactly here. But the, the first step is just kind of figuring out what block of crops is going to go where. And I would say it's more important than the long beds that kind of rotation, or really mapping that out with the short beds, it tends to be, because there's so much turnover in those beds, it's a little bit harder to have a set rotation plan for those beds. So I still think that through, but it's a little bit more fluid in those beds than it is with the long beds. So, and then just to mention the high tunnel, so um, I have one 30 by 96 high tunnel, and so we rotate that. We have basically three seasons in that tunnel. So we have a spring season where we plant, you know, the next few weeks. Uh, typically, we plant spinach and lettuce. Although we do also um, sometimes plant arugula and kale. And then we, in the summer, we have tomatoes in there. Generally, just tomatoes. I also have tried other crops in there and may try other crops in the future. But generally, it's just tomatoes. And then in the fall, we'll rip out the tomatoes and we plant spinach and lettuce. And then we. Generally, we'll harvest that up through December, and then the spinach will harvest in January and February. So that's kind of the rotation that we have in the high tunnel. So you can see it's not a, it's the same crops every year. And so part of the problem is with having only one high tunnel, it's difficult to have an actual rotation. Um, so I'm hoping over the years to add more tunnels and to be able to do more rotation. And then Having more tunnels would also allow us to potentially have a fallow period. So, for example, we could take one tunnel, uh, let's say we have like three tunnels, we could take one tunnel every year and we could just grow a cover crop in there. So, to give it a rest, to break up disease cycles, to break up weed cycles. Um, but currently, because we have only one tunnel, we're doing this, it's working so far. I mentioned there's some pitfalls to that, but I'll kind of cross that bridge when I come to it. Um, so these are the crop families that we're rotating within the, within the tunnel. You know, functionally, we're really just rotating lettuce, spinach, and nightshade. And like I said, with the tomatoes, we're just growing the tomatoes in the same, same place every year. Um, this is just a, a schematic that I came up with recently to show how we flip the tunnel from one season to another. So on the left, what you're seeing is, this is what it looks like when we have small, we have fall and spring greens in the tunnel. and so. The black strips are landscape fabric, and then the green strips are the planted bed. And then kind of each row in this spreadsheet is a foot. So you see it's 30 feet, so this is looking across the tunnel. And so you can see on the edges, we have three-foot fabric. Along the edges, that's kind of a permanent walkway. Some growers like grow all the way up to the edges of the tunnel. I'm six foot eight. It's really hard for me to put right up against the edge of the tunnel. And so I like to have a walkway where we can walk all the way around. Um, and then you can see we have the four foot beds, and we plant with a paper pot transplanter, and that's how we plant our lettuce and spinach. So we do six rows on a four foot wide bed, which is about eight or nine inches between row. It's about as close as you can get the paper pot transplanter uh, between uh, just going down the bed. Um, and then we actually generally remove the landscape fabric, so we just have a one foot bare soil bed, um, or sorry, bare soil pathway between the beds that we'll just wheel hoe for weed control. Okay, so that's fall and spring. When we flip into our summer production, which is tomatoes, we roll out landscape fabric onto those pathways. So we roll it right over the center of the pathway. And so we're covering that one foot pathway, plus we're covering a foot on either side. 
And so we're narrowing our beds down to two feet wide now. So we have a two foot wide strip. And that's where we're planting our tomatoes. And most recently, we've been planting them in a single row and doing a double and training them to a double leader. So we have a single row of tomatoes spaced one foot apart with a double leader going to a wire that runs, the wire would run like right here and right here, so right along the edges of the bed, running all the way down the, the length of the high tunnel. And so we're training the tomatoes up to that wire. Um, I think that I'm, what I'm going to do this year is I'm actually going to do a double row of single leaders um, because I think I might have, um, basically I think the system I've been using is more for a grafted tomato and I'm not grafting. And so I'm moving more towards a double row single leader. So I'll be planting, instead of planting the tomatoes right down the center, I'll be planting them like in a diamond style on either side. So they'll be more directly above the wire. Um, and then when we flip back into fall production, we rip out the tomatoes, we take out the landscape fabric. Usually we irrigate um, because the, the soil is quite dry at that point and it's been compacted from us walking up and down the pathways. And then we'll broad fork, lay down a bunch of compost, and then we'll plant our, our um, lettuce and spinach into that. And so we've been managing the, 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 the high tunnel no-till um, for the last several years, but I think it's working really well. Any questions so far about, uh, about this or anything else I've, I've talked about? We'll also have to leave time for questions and put at the end. So. I probably like shouldn't be showing this because it's from a book, but I got this from I got this from Andrew Met Method's book just to show you. This is where I got this system from. So if you're interested in that, I don't know if they have that in the bookstore, but you can go check it out. But basically, it shows shows you how to use this for a bunch of different crops. So. So I'm reading that. Um, okay. And so I but um, so why when you say you think that's for graphic, can you explain a little bit more of why you're switching? Like, is it the yield? It's that the, the tomato basically doesn't have enough um, doesn't have enough productivity to maintain two stems because it will go with grafted varieties, it's got a much stronger root stock, and so it has a stronger root system, so it can really produce on two stems. And from conversations with other growers, and actually, if you read the recommendation in this book, that's exactly what he says. I just kind of skipped over that and didn't do it for a few minutes. So I'm going back to what the recommendation is, which is if you're not grafting, do a single leader because the plant will be able to produce more fruit on that single stem versus if you're trying to train it to two stems. You're kind of like overtaxing the plant, it's my, my understanding, unless it's grafted, so. Yeah, so when you're pulling out the tomatoes and then you kind of pull that landscape fabric off and you're going back into your fall production, you said you're using a paper pot transplanter? Yeah. So what are you doing beyond broad forking to prep the planting area in a way that's adequate for the paper pot transplanter? So yeah, the, the sequence is, if I'm remembering it correctly, the sequence is we irrigate, then we broad fork, and then we lay down the compost, and then we will either wheel hoe or tilt, so use the tilter, okay. to basically get enough, um, yeah, to basically get enough loose soil to be able to run the paper pot transplanter. And I run the paper pot transplanter on the, on the um, shallowest depth. I found that works best, especially in a no-till system, because if you run it on a deeper depth, the shoe is just gonna catch any quads that are gonna be you know, underneath there. Um, so that's worked for us. And are you using some sort of a tool to ensure that those paper pots are buried if you're putting them in as shallow as you are? Usually we just we do it as a two-person team, and so like I'll just run the paper pot transplanter, and then someone will just come behind me and they'll just kind of kick soil in around it or, or use their hands. Yeah. Okay. So that's just what that looks like, um, what the uh, high tunnel looks like with the landscape fabric, with the tomatoes in a single row. We did some interplanting of beneficial plants, so borage, marigold, basil, some other things in there, so that's what you're seeing. And there's some weeds in there too. And we run a double drip tape um, right along the, uh, the tomatoes, and I just like the double because it, it just gets more water down uh, more quickly. And so you can see, we use the tomahooks which we don't actually use that system to actually like lower the yeah. tomatoes, but I like that for just being able to get it on the wire easily. And then we use the plastic tomato clips, and we come in and we'll prune the lower parts of the tomato, um, and we'll prune off any suckers. So we're just training the tomatoes to two. And like I said, I'm going to go to just training them to a single leader. Um, and then you know we're pruning kind of throughout the season, usually up until about harvest time, and then we 
kind of run out of time and stop for me at a certain point, but it's to just increase the airflow and make sure that it's not a jungle in there. Um, the last farm I worked on, we would kind of stop pruning in like May, and so you would go in there and it would be like going into a, into a jungle, and it would be extremely humid and hot, and you'd be covered in tomato pollen. Um, so I try to avoid that, but the, but the pruning labor is sometimes difficult to balance with everything else you're trying to do on the farm. And then this is what it looks like in the spring or fall configuration, and this is this, this fall. Um, so you can see there's uh, you know, roughly half spinach and half lettuce. So I've got some kale in there. I'm going to stop doing kale because we don't plant it early enough to actually get good yield from that. We would need to plant it probably in late August or early September to really get nice sized plants. And so I planted, end up planting it too late and then you just have small kale plants and they don't produce. But spinach and lettuce work really well in the window that we plant in, which is Generally, we're planting the end of September or early October. So we're ripping out those tomato plants in like mid to late September, and then we're replanting in the fall greens in late September, early October. And then our aim is to have greens in November, which is around the time that we have to stop harvesting outdoors. So we try to harvest outdoors as long as possible, and then we move into the high zone. So with your pathways being so narrow, how do you starting at one end and harvesting down, or are you able to harvest in those pads? And you've got like, like, yeah, uh, no, we don't do like the Pac-Man style of like mm -hmm. plant the whole tunnel out. Um, so we do have the pathways to walk down, um, and, there, and the plant the plant rows are a little bit into the bed, so that the pathway, I mean, even though you're not just walking the bed, functionally the pathway is more like 18 inches, you know, okay. between plants. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit difficult with the getting a harvest toe. So generally, we kind of harvest, and then we're dragging the toe over what we just harvested. You know, because it's actually hard to get our toes down the pathway itself. But it is a little awkward. We have hoops in here too, and the hoops get in the way. So it's always a little bit, a little bit awkward harvesting in this kind of style. But we want to maximize the amount of growing area. I haven't yet found the, the motivation to try to move towards that kind of Pac-Man style, which is what that means is people plant the entire tunnel like wall to wall. There's no pathways, and then you just harvest your way through the tunnel. So you just walk over what you harvested. And that's a way of packing in as many, as many greens as possible into the high zone space. Um, so some of the challenge to crop rotation, um, I think just growing different amounts of the different families, like brassicas are always overrepresented on those special farms, so it's, it's always hard to rotate brassicas with other, other things and, not, and try to not grow brassicas in the same spot every year. Um, and then like for me, my production levels change from year to year, I mean part of that is you know, a beginning farm especially, you know, as you're growing or as you're changing your markets, the amounts you're growing of things is going to change and that's going to, that's why that idea that, well, I'm going to have a set crop rotation, I'm going to use that. Well, you could have a set crop rotation one year and then your market changes or your size changes and you're going to have to change that. Um, and then I think there's always the unexpected adjustments in the season for us, soil conditions, we've got to get this in right now. And so we're going to plant it somewhere where it maybe wasn't in the crop rotation plan, but it's just because the soil conditions are right. Um, sometimes you've gone short on transplants, or you know, so you've planted one less bed of something that you didn't have the transplants. So all those things can change. Um, and then I think there's always a question about growing things in blocks. So like all the brassicas grow here, all the alliums grow here, versus growing them as a more heterogeneous distribution. So like you know, some brassicas here, some alliums here. I think the block system is easier to scheme out. It's easier to like plan that way, but also you're concentrating potential pest and disease problems in a single block. Like you're making it very easy for pests to move in and be able to like move from crop to crop if all of the crops in a single family are together. Um, and I'm working in a two-acre field, so it's not as though I can really spread things out that much. But even just having something on, like for example, in that map I showed you in the far field versus in you know, the field that's farther um, to the west, I, I see differences in how, like if I plant my spring cucurbits in one field and I plant my fall cucurbits in another field, it takes a while for them to move from, from crop to crop. So for example, like they basically will destroy the spring and zucchini and cucumber, talking about cucumber deals and squash bugs, and then once that crop is destroyed or I've ripped it out, then they move to the next crop. Whereas if they were right next to each other, I don't know if that would happen. I think they would just spread right between each other. Um, 
so yeah, there's probably more to say about that. I think there's also considerations of you know being able to interplant with um, beneficials um, to break up blocks of crops, which also can compl compl complicate your crop rotation. Um, but these are just some basic principles that I try to follow. So I mean, at the very least, you're not growing the same thing in the same soil every year. I mean, I, the high tunnel being the exception. Um, you know, at least every other year, better yet, three years, I think is a minimum. If there's different recommendations for different diseases and different crops, you know, some people will say three to five years, but in general, if you're breaking up a pest or disease cycle over a single year, I think that's, sometimes that's the best you can do, depending on how much space you have. Um, being aware of edges where diseases can transfer, so I changed the orientation of my fields, so they used to run um, east-west and I changed them to running north-south and what that meant was now all my beds for one year ran across the previous year's beds and so like there was no way for me to avoid growing broccoli where I had grown broccoli the previous year and so what I found was that was where the black rot transferred so the end of the bed where where like my current bed crossed the old bed that's where the black rot showed up first and then after that year things got better because like, it just was that one year where I changed the orientation of the beds. Um, and then obviously if you have identifiable disease or, or uh, pest issues that you know um, are a problem on your farm, learn about the life cycles of those things. It might make sense to, for example, with black drought, it makes sense to till in your residue um, into the soil either that fall or early the next spring, because the black drought will carry over on the residue. Um, tillage can also help with some insects that overwinter in the soil. Um, so if you till and fall, and not that that's generally good practice, but if you have a specific problem you're trying to address, it can make sense. Um, and then soil testing every year or every other year is important. Um, and then you can adjust your amendments based on the soil test and the actual needs of the crops you're growing. So actually understanding you know, what do brassicas need, what do almonds need. What do cucurbits need in trying to amend your soil based on the needs of those crops, rather than just having a, maybe a fertility program that you use for the whole farm without regard to um, the crops you're growing or the particularities of your fields. Because I know each of my fields has its own particularities. One field is kind of high in phosphorus, one field is generally lower in organic matter. So knowing what each of your fields, what the needs are of each of those fields, so you can try to address them specifically rather than just kind of using a blanket program to address your whole farm. So just to talk a little bit about record keeping and the way I do it, um, I come up with a crop rotation field plan and I, I just use spreadsheets for this. So I kind of have a spreadsheet that's similar to that map I showed you, but it's in a spreadsheet form. So like each row is a bed in that system. And I think I have a screenshot of that next. And then I want to have my actual crop planting field map. So this is my plan and this, this is what I actually did. Um, and then that crop, planting field map becomes my historical record of crop rotation. So if I have one of, one of those for each year, then I can look back and be like, this is what I planted where in 2021, this is what I planted in 2020, 2019, so I can make actual crop rotation decisions. Because if you don't remember where you planted things, you can't actually make good crop rotation decisions. And so this is just what that looks like in the, the spreadsheet. So you can see I've just you know, taken the columns and merged them across the rows, and so each of those, each of these columns is a bed, and I have a little code, you know, for the bed, so like this is, you know, that's long field east, the you know, bed 24, um, and then I've got, this is actually part of my plan for this year, so what crop I'm gonna grow, sometimes I'll also put in the cover crop that I'm growing in there, um, but this is the plan, and so then I'm gonna wanna capture the actual planting that I did this year, because if I just have the plan, and I'm going to plan for next year, I don't necessarily know if I actually followed through with that plan or not, or if I had to make adjustments. Um, I'm going to just kind of provide a different farm's example of um, the way that we rotate the crops. Um, so my farm is Humboldt Harvest. I'm in Decorah, Iowa, um, and we have had five years on this plan. Um, uh, so this is a picture from our first for a second, in our second year on the farm. Um, and, um, yeah, so our, we have a, a two-acre field, and it's laid out um, in six sections, 150-foot beds, um, about 20 beds per section. 
attention. Um, and, and so that is kind of the, the scheme under which we rotate our tracks. Um, Can you turn up the volume a little bit, please? Oh. I think with your shield, it's hard. What? With the shield, it's hard. I can just take it up. How about that? Wait, oh, yeah. better. Okay. Um, yes. So this is a picture of planting garlic. Um, so garlic is our, our um, we have six sections. We're entering into year six of our farm. So we'll have gone through every single section um, after this year. And then we'll be re restarting next, in 2023, we'll be restarting the cycle. So um, uh, Allianz is, is our first, um, first uh, section. And so we plant our garlic, we plant onions, shallots, um, leeks um, in this section. Um, it's the least, uh, it's the least number of beds that we need to use of any section. So sometimes we stick in, um, maybe if you want to plant some corn, popcorn or something for fun, um, we'll we'll throw them in the alley in section. But otherwise, we can cover crop about half half of the section during the year. Um, this picture is actually of um, our no-till system, which we started just a couple years ago. We started transitioning our farm to no-till. So that means we, um, this, yeah, this year with garlic, we, we actually put furrows in our no-till beds and then covered those. Once we planted the garlic, we covered it with compost, and that was our method of, of kind of covering the furrows and then we mulch after that. Um, but yeah, our, our no-till system is basically compost-based. We, we build up a bed, um, we, we kind of dig out pathways that we can, um, that, are, that are permanent, and then we can add compost to the bed um, to kind of re-tilt and open it up. Uh, can you hear me? No. Uh, Now? No. It's good this last session too. Yeah, last they just don't have a battery to last year. They've been having problems. I'll just talk really loud. Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> Great. Kind of. Okay. I'll, I'll be as loud as I can. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's enough on the no tell situation. So, um, Alliums, most of them come out of the field pretty early um, in, in the fall or late summer. Um, and so we are then able to cover crop almost immediately um, uh, for, for the whole fall. So we either put in oats and peas or a rye and vetch mixture, depending on whether we went to overwinter the crop. Oh, yes, in fact. Um, uh, so if if we want a cover crop that's going to extend into the spring and grow in the spring, then we use rye and vetch. And if we want to be able to work the ground immediately in the spring, we use something that winter kills, like oats and peas. Um, we also are usually able to get a round of buckwheat in, um, which is a summer crop and will kill, will die at first frost. Um, we're usually able to get a round of buckwheat in after the alliums. Um, yes, those are our garlics coming up. Um, so this picture is of our cucurbit section. Um, yeah, we, we follow our alliums with cucurbits. And um, uh, the, yeah, the, this picture is Basically, winter squash um, will spread over many beds, so we have to think about what we're going to do with the ground that is in between these um, these rows of cucurbits. Um, uh, so that that year, this picture is when we planted a bunch of lettuce in between rows of cucurbits before they spread out, um, so that we could kind of get two different crops out of the same. Um, same zone. Um, and of course it gets complicated, uh, like we ha you have to get the lettuce out before it starts getting overwhelmed by the 
um, by the vines because otherwise it's really a mess to walk around in there. Um, our next zone is roots. So roots for us include um, carrots, beets, um, turnips. So a bunch of different crop families, um, the carrot family and the rasp family, but the turnips are. Um, and the, um, yeah, so that's that's an interesting thing because the roots are basically, that section is basically about our, the way we cultivate the crops, the way they're grown, the kind of season we have, rather than what family they're in. Um, so, yeah, that, that's the way we think about our roots. And this, this is our brassica section, so it's the most full of any of our sections. We have to fill it up every year um, with cabbage, kale, broccoli, um, collards, Brussels sprouts, um, and kohlrabi. Uh, and so, but it, I think it's the most beautiful <laughs> of the sections. Um, and again, thinking about cover cropping, we um, basically are able to cover crop bed by bed. So our kohlrabi comes out pretty early in the season and we're able to put in a buckwheat cover crop um, there. Um, or we're able to even do double crops um, Kohlrabi before. We don't have the same black rot problem that Jordan has. Um, yeah, so uh, we're able to kind of fit things in. And then always thinking when we plant our fall cover crops, okay, it, is our next crop going to need to go in in the, in the spring or can it wait until June? Um, and in which case we would plant rye. Or, or something that would that would really pop up the organic matter and, and grow in the spring as well. <laughs> this is a totally messy messy picture. Um, so our our tomato section, um, we also include our um, our beans in that section because um, they kind of have a similar season. We want to we want to plant them after all the injured crops after the soil's worked up. Um, and we plant several different successions of beans. So we've been figuring out, just kind of trial and error over the years, figuring out ways to kind of manage the architecture, I guess, of, of our section so that we can harvest the tomatoes easily and the beans won't be too much in the way. Um, so we've, yeah, we've started kind of alternating tomatoes and beans to just add more, um, variety and more, more kind of ability to move around in, in that section. Um, yes, and then the final section is our, our green section. So our lettuce, our, um, our uh, mustard mixes, um, our spinach, and then we also put our peas in the green section. Again, because it, they kind of match the timing of greens. We, we put them in in the spring and um, yeah, and, and get them out kind of fairly early in the season. So we can, we can also double crop in our green section uh, as, as we need to. Um, yep, that's my co-farmer also in the greens, in the green section. You can see the peas in the background. Um, yeah. And this is just a picture of, of buckwheat cover crops surrounding like a weedy parsley patch. <laughs> um, just uh, thinking about the, yeah, the timing of cover cropping is a really interesting question that we're always, uh, always working out and, and making sure everything is accessible and that we can, we can just get as much stuff growing um, as we can, as possible, but um, without overwhelming our, <laughs> our eyelids of parsley. Yeah, and I believe that is it. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. How are you breaking down um, your cover crops doing complete no-till? Like, yes, so the question is how are we breaking down cover crops, especially when we're doing no-till agriculture? Um, so um, a number of different ways. We tried a number of different ways. So we've tried just like pulling them out of the bed, like weeding them out, um, which is is not actually as bad as it sounds. Um, but 
it takes a lot of time. Um, the other big thing that I think both Jordan and I are trying is um, <coughs> silent chirping um, and using silent chirps to break down. Break down number Do you want to ask about that? Oh, uh, sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the way that I've done that is I have a flail mower that goes on a BCS, and so I'll flail mow it and then lay the, lay the tarp down. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this, and I talked about this with silage charts, but you don't get all that much residue breakdown we found. That's sort of how silage charts were sold to us, I guess, or sold to me, is you get a lot of residue breakdown. But, I find that's not so much the case, it just kind of kills what's there. And then it will start to decompose a little bit. I'm actually interested in possibly using clear plastic to try to get more residue breakdown. Um, but yeah, because you don't get the residue breakdown, I think that like for me, if I want a direct seed or a paper pot into there, I need to then like rake that residue off or do something with it after I pull the tarp off. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely have just covered the um, the bed with um, with compost, like just like kill it with a silage chart, kill the cover crop, and then just cover the bed with compost and plant directly into that. Um, and yeah, we don't use a paper pot transplanter; we just transplant by hand, so it, it works for us. Uh, what have you found? for your no-till systems and direct seeding, is that something that you find that you're able to do or is that kind of a, you, you, you have to transition more heavily into, into transplant? Yeah, so my co-farmer manages the direct seeding and she hates using seeders. She just makes a burrow and direct seeds with her hand into it. And so we can do that in the no-till system, no problem really. Um, what we have found, um, we, we actually found that our germination was best um, when we would make a furrow, and just like the picture with the garlic, we make a furrow, we seed into it, and then we just cover it directly with compost. And that was the best germination we could get. Jordan, I'm curious to know why you switched your um, it was really just to uh, orient things more for the tractor because if you have a hundred foot beds, the turnarounds doing it with the tractor is is terrible. So it was just to, so I didn't have to do as many turnarounds with the tractor. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily like oh north south is better. It was more just because of the way my fields were oriented. Yeah. Curious with uh, I spent the cover crop with the part. What was your weed kill like? Yeah, so the question is, what's the weed kill like with a uh, silage chart? I, I mean, it kills annual weeds very well. I think the issue is typically perennials. So, like, we both have some issues with thistles. I'll even have some dandelion issues. So, yeah, perennials, it does not kill perennials unless you leave it in place for like an entire season. So, but it will kill, it very effectively kills annual weeds. The, the question is, it will kill the existing growth, but as soon as you pull it off, more weeds can germinate. So, like, I think sometimes in, in a tillage situation, people will till first and then put the tarp down because they want to like flush the weeds out um, before they tarp because you can run into the situation where you kill the existing weed growth, but then there's a whole other generation that's just going to come up as soon as it's triggered by pulling off the tarp. So. Yeah, and I'll add that we, we have a big thistle problem. So yeah, we found that our annual weed pressure is not as bad in an ocean system because we're using um, we're using uh, compost as a mulch. Um, but uh, our our thistle problem is is huge. They just keep coming back, and so we try to um, tart kind of any part of the farm that doesn't have something growing on it um, in a in a for, for like a three-week chunk of time or more, um, we try to put a tarp on to get those thistles stopped for a second. Have either of you experimented with living mulch in your permanent rows to the extent that you have them? And what have you used and how do you manage the height or how does it work? Have you? I have not. I've not done living uh, living mulch. I do use Dutch white clover in other parts of my farm, and that's one. Oh, sorry. I do use Dutch white clover 
in other parts of my farm, and that's one that I've seen other people use in that situation, but I've not personally tried it in my growing beds. I use it in my, like, tractor pathways, like my access roads. Yeah, I've also never tried a living mulch other than once I tried some clover and um, had a bunch of weeds germinated with it, and it just didn't make sense. That's why I just wheeled it in. <laughs> but I would love to figure that out. When you guys use the tarps to uh, suppress the cover crops, does the temperature affect the effectiveness of the tarp? Like if it's early spring versus in the middle of summer? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I mean, I think the, yeah, I think there's definitely a heat effect with the tarp um, that can I think that might have an effect on residue breakdown, potentially, although I was saying I'd still sort of be satisfied even in the summer. But I think the main way the tarp works is by excluding light. So I, I think in the case of the tarp, it's not so much that it's heating up the soil, it's that it's excluding light, which that's what's killing things. Um, with clear plastic, it's the, it's the heat that is actually um, killing things and breaking down residue. So. So when you're doing your crop rotations um, in the sections that you're doing double cropping in, you're rotating at the end of the season, right? So if you have all of your bracket put in one section, you know, like some of us have longer seasons. So if you're double cropping multiple times, you're not worried about rotating into a different section at that point. You're, so you're kind of looking at it from a season perspective. Are you both looking at it that way, the, in those sections? I definitely am. Year by year, grass go here and nowhere else on the farm, kind of. Yeah, well, in the place that I'm double cropping, I'm usually changing families. But my understanding is, like, because I, I kind of had, had this question, too. It's like, is crop rotation always between crops, or is it just between seasons? And I think, um, I don't know, maybe best best practices would be yes between crops, but I think there is some leeway where like yes you could rotate, like you could grow lettuce twice. There might be reasons not to do that for other reasons, but like, you know, in terms of an overall crop rotation, I think that's fine to grow to grow things in the same um, to grow the same family in the same beds, same fields in the same year. Yeah. You might do multiple crops of salanova in the same bed, or you do. I haven't done that, but it's like, it's again, like because I, I want to have flexibility, I, I, I can have myself doing that if I had to. I try not to. I try as best I can to rotate between crops as I can, and usually I'd be able to do that, but I, it is something that I would do if I, if I had to. Yeah. In, in your greenhouse, when you said after tomatoes, when you go, you bring in a ton of compost. How many yards of compost in there? What, what does a ton mean? Yeah, yeah, so um, it's, I think it's pretty quantifiable. It's, um, we usually lay about an inch over the top of the soil across the bed surface. And uh, we do it, we move with a tractor bucket and then we'll dump it into, because we can't put the tractor in the tunnel, we dump it into wheelbarrows. So we line up three wheelbarrows, dump the, the compost into those three wheelbarrows, and I'm trying to think, I have this written down. I want to say, an inch. what's that? An inch. Uh, yeah, I think we're using probably three to five bucket loads per bed, if I remember correctly. And in general, I think I've quantified it, but we end up using about a cubic yard per bed. It's in general, if we're doing that fixed mulch layer, so we get it delivered in you know, 40, basically 40 ton loads, and, and that will cover about 40 beds. And that's your experience, too. Yeah. That's about the rate we're using to get that one inch thick, like heavy mulch. Yeah. Thank figure out the, the problem when we row cover, 
uh, for flea beetles, it's, it's often on brassicas that are going to bolt really fast, especially with that hot um, row cover. So that's that's hard to kind of negotiate. Um, but yeah, I haven't. My understanding is if it's a flying insect, then unless you're able to isolate long distances, it doesn't, the rotation isn't going to matter for that because the flea beetles are just going to find the crop. They don't necessarily overwinter in the soil, or if they do, they'll just come up and find the crop. So that is less of a crop rotation issue than, like Hannah said, it's just more physical exclusion. And I think that's the case with other pests like cucumber beetles. They're just going to come find your cucurbits. It doesn't matter if you rotate them. Um, it's not really the crop rotation related, but you were talking about the row cover. Do you have an issue with it blowing off? And um, how do you just secure it uh, or not let it rip? Yes. So how do we secure row cover? I, um, yeah, in my obsession with excluding flea beetles, I have uh, gone into burying this, the side of the row cover. Um, and. Um, so just like continual dirt on all edges of, of the row cover. Um, and then the problem is at, if it's arugula or something and I'm harvesting multiple times, um, actually get like pinning it back down um, under under that row of dirt <laughs> um, after every harvest. Yeah, the other problem with row cover that I've noticed is that it, it creates this microclimate that's really kind of luscious and aphids love it and they get all over the those crops and that's kind of gross. <laughs> yeah, I have a question for you. Where do potatoes and sweet potatoes fit into your location? We put potatoes in our tomato section. Okay, I was wondering about that. <coughs> What about you? Sweet potatoes? We don't anymore. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I treat them as a nightshade, so simply I treat the potatoes, so yeah, they're just rotated in that way. Yeah. Um, one thing I also want to, I don't know if you're personally still in the room, but I was going to say about how we've done direct seeding with no-till. So it's similar to what I talked about with the, the high tunnel, where we're trying to get enough tilt to be able to run that either pot transplanter through. And we did have issues where, you know, the cedar is skipping. So if we're pushing a cedar through the soil, it's like hitting a hard pan layer and just kind of skipping. Um, but this year I switched to using a jam cedar and it's a lot heavier and it's been a lot better for no-till because it can just kind of plow through sections that where an earthway is very light will just kind of skip. So that's one thing I found that really helps um, with direct seeding into a no-till situation or any kind of situation where you have tighter soil or more residue, it's just it's a, it's a more robust, heavier steer. Jang, it's a Jang cedar. Uh, J-A-N-G. There's probably some vendors who sell that here that you can look at. When you're planting your cover crop, do you use broadcast those or do you sell those in the soil? We broadcast our cover crops. With, yeah, I, I broadcast uh, with a little like earthway chest spreader, and then I, I have a cultivator, so I, I generally will cultivate that in, or sometimes I'll disc it in. I've also tilled it in too with a rototiller, um, but uh, it's not. I'm not wild. I, I would, would like a better system because it's a lot of passes over the field. It'd be nice to be able to do things in a single pass rather than having to. Do you have a pass, but... Cool, any more questions? Yes. Do you guys transplant in the residue of the cover crop? Yeah, we have, um, we, so... Yes, okay. Uh, um, I didn't do it. <laughs> the question is, do we transplant into the residue of the cover crop? Um, we would only transplant into the residue of a dead cover crop, um, for sure. Um, and we would add, um, we would add a compost mulch over it, so it wouldn't, it, there would be a lot of tilt um, of that compost um, as we as we transplant it. So it wouldn't feel like very residue. -y. <laughs> and I would I till in the 
residue before I plant because generally I'm not using cover crops in those short beds, although I'm kind of moving in that direction and I would do similar things to what Hannah's doing, like parking it, get the other first. Um, yeah. Through the grass, because they haven't had your socks, um, are you pulling them with the cotton on the soil, pulling by the trees, pulling them with the cotton on the soil? Yeah, so the question is, how do we get, like, brassicas, like Brussels sprouts or stuff with heavier socks? stocks out of the soil if we're not tilling it in. Um, and we have tried multiple things. We've tried just pulling the whole thing up. Um, and it's it's awkward because it's like frozen in the fall and by the time we're like pulling the by the time we're pulling the, the brassicas out it's like the soil's like frozen and it's really challenging. So we, we switched to just chopping them off at the soil level um, and leaving leaving that root system in there to kind of rot. And because we're rotating, I think uh, our roots come next after after our brassicas and so we're direct seeding. So we just make furrows and, and it, it has worked out. And just, just